I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Eric Chan, a non-resident research fellow at the Global Taiwan Institute. Eric is also a strategist with the U.S. Air Force, where he provides USAF and Department of Defense leadership with expertise on PRC military capabilities, political leadership, strategic culture, and competition. Eric was previously the China, Korea, Philippines, and Vietnam Country Director at the Air Force International Affairs Office. He's also served as an analyst at the Air Force Strategic Deterrence and Nuclear Integration Office, providing expertise on PRC nuclear doctrine. Eric is widely published on Chinese influence and operations in for information warfare, Taiwan military reform, military diplomacy with the PLA, and the strategic balance in East Asia. He's written for numerous publications, including the USAF Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs, The Diplomat, War on the Rocks, and the Foreign Policy Research Center, New Delhi Journal. He holds a master's degree in international affairs from George Washington University and a BA in political science and history from the University of California in San Diego. He joins us today to discuss North Korea. Eric, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me, sir. I, I, I can't thank you enough. Your expertise is really unparalleled in this area. So it, let me also thank you for your career of service to our country as well. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that I'd love to do an interview on North Korea, and you described it as a perennial problem that needs to be managed rather than solved. I'm wondering, could you explain a little bit about what you what you meant by that statement? Sure. Well, first, thank you very much for having me. It's going to be a great discussion today, I can tell. So North Korea, like I said, it's a perennial problem, primarily because the U.S. primary demand of denuclearization is completely diametrically opposed to what North Korea wants for itself, like Kim Jong-un wants, which is regime survival. And he views regime survival as dependent on him having nukes. So between the two, absent you know, all that war, don't think we're going to get to a place where we're going to see North Korea actually accept denuclearization. So as a result, this is why it's going to be a problem that we're going to have to manage over the years versus you know, hoping that it will go away uh, very soon one way or another. The Kim regime has been uh, more resilient than most people would have given it credit for. Ah, now, no, so North Korea has been described as a hermit kingdom. And I think that's kind of an interesting phrase because it willfully walls itself off from the rest of the world. Does it make it more or less of a challenge to, to work with them than perhaps a nation like China, which is engaged in trade and policy around the globe. Right. So it's a di different level of challenge, right? For China's case, you know, there, there's going to be more use of you know subversion in addition to you know legitimate cooperation and you know economic development between the two countries. With North Korea, it's completely different because it's always a level of a threat involved of coercion, right? So. Uh, North Korea is well known for its use of uh, blackmail, which is, you know, terrible under, you know, any circumstance. But there's a certain logic to it and um, there's certain ways of dealing with that. So while it is a different challenge, I would say it's at once a harsher challenge, but also a simpler one to deal with. It's something that, um, you know, South Korea has been dealing with for a number of years, of course, and then uh, we've been dealing with for a long time. Uh, the primary uh, methods of communication on both sides really haven't changed all that much since you know North Korea, uh, you know, got away in the Korean War. Mm, okay. Well, now could you compare them to Cuba at all? The reason I wondered about that is they're both these standalone communist regimes, right? And again, they're kind of hermit kingdoms. They they kind of seal themselves off from the rest of the world. They both have struggling economies. And in some ways, it seems like they both have kind of limited influence, I guess. Or maybe, you know, maybe because of the the sealed off nature of where they're at. Uh, are they similar? Do we treat them similarly from a foreign policy perspective? Uh, actually, we, we don't, just simply because North Korea presents a much bigger threat than Cuba, right? First of all, um, North Korea obviously has uh, nuclear, um, you know, nuclear weapons now. 
second of all, uh, even if they didn't have the nuclear weapons, they have a long range artillery that could uh, threaten uh, Seoul. And of course, they also have missiles that can threaten uh, Japan as well. So there's much more capability in terms of North Korea to threaten other countries. Also, there is a question of what you, um, what North Korea wants to do with this power, right? Um, its primary interest is regime survival, which is similar to what Cuba's got. But at the same time, North Korea is also interested in you know unification with South Korea, right? Unification of the entire peninsula under the Kim banner, right? People tend to forget about that, but it's something that North Korea actually believes in and still would like to do if it ever got the chance. And now it's not likely, but they're still looking for ways to make it happen. So the level of threat is, is completely different. And uh, the fact that they still have, you know, a nominal uh, great power backer in the form of China, uh, this makes uh, Kim bigger threat to deal with than Cuba, especially because Cuba is much more interested in, you know, keeping their heads down, occasionally kicking Uncle Sam when they get the chance, but it, it's not very, it's not very coordinated, nor is it, you know, nor is it very uh, urgent for them to do so. For Korea, it's North Korea, it's different. Well, and as you mentioned, they are a nuclear power, right? And so I guess we can't ignore them because of that. H how do you think that capability changes the way other nations interact with them? Or, or does it? Yeah, so for uh, South Korea, it's actually limited change just because, uh, you know, some things like long-range artillery have always threatened Seoul. And that's where most of the South Korean populace lives. That's where the biggest part of the South Korean economy is. So... North Korea has always had a dagger to the throat of South Korea for the longest time. Uh, for the case of Japan now, that's completely different, right? Because Japan used to think that they were relatively protected, but now, of course, with uh, nuclear weapons and uh, you know, North Korean ballistic missile capability, that's no longer an option. They're not really protected like they used to be. And increasingly, the U.S. as well, just as uh, North Korean ballistic missile technology improves, right? It used to be the U.S. was untouchable, but now, you know, there's places like, you know, Alaska, perhaps, um, you know, maybe even Hawaii in the future that would certainly be threatened by uh, North Korean uh, nukes. And just because uh, nukes are so much of an area weapon, those missiles don't need to be very precise to really, you know, hit and make effects on the target. So yes, uh, definitely the nukes have been something of a game changer for the uh, North Koreans to be able to execute deterrence. It's a much stronger deterrence than conventional deterrence. So uh, while South Korea doesn't really have to change too much in the way that it deals with North Korea, South Korea now also has to deal with the fact that uh, its primary ally, the, the U.S., now has a level of threat that it doesn't, didn't feel before. It has to deal with the fact that Japan is feeling this level of threat. So there's a lot more players that are suddenly interested in the region, and that's something that uh, South Korea has been coming to terms with over the last 20 years. Okay. Okay. Now, so you, you just actually mentioned, I, I think this is a really key point. You mentioned a, a possible threat to Alaska, a possible threat in the future to Hawaii. So the, the Council on Foreign Relations has written that North Korea could have the material for more than 100 nuclear weapons. And that was just based on analyst estimates. And it's also successfully tested missiles that could strike the United States, again, potentially Alaska, maybe Hawaii, with the nuclear warhead. Um, what kind of risk is there to the U.S., do you think, in terms of, the, in terms of North Korea? So in terms of a complete strike out of a blue, I mean, that's not going to happen, right? Um, because nor the nukes are something of a bluff. They're a one-time use sort of thing. Kim knows if he ever uses nukes, then he himself is dead. His whole regime is going to be dead. So there's uh, clear limits on what those nukes are going to be good for, right? And when you're talking about the level of, say, 100 nukes or so, uh, that makes for what we would call more of a credible deterrent, right? If he had, say, just a few nukes, you know, two, three, five nukes, or so that would actually make him a bigger target than if uh, he didn't have any nukes at all, right? If there's only a limited number, then uh, there would be 
a lot of pressure on the U.S. and on South Korea and Japan in the opening stages of a war to do a preemptive attack or to do some sort of attack to take out those nukes before uh, they could possibly be used. Now, with 100 nukes, that's uh, less of a chance. We know that it's uh, more survivable. So uh, there's less risk of this type of uh, preemptive attack from the other countries. But at the same time, he also knows that, okay, with uh, like the level of nukes now, it's enough to make it really painful for Korea and Japan and the US. It wouldn't be enough to destroy them. But at the same time, you know, if say South Korean and US and UN troops or whatever, we're going, you know, we're, we're doing that fight with, with North Korea and we're advancing on the North Korean capital, uh, he would then have a deterrent to say, you know, you guys can't go any further, right? All right, we fought, we fought the war. I'm obviously losing, but if you go any further, then I will use the nukes. And that's credible then. Yeah, yeah. So it definitely sounds like more of a strategic tool then, right? And yes. as you've said, it's it's one of those, it's one-time use because, you know, and I think for it, it seems like for most nations, for all nations, maybe, we're, we're kind of all in that boat, right? Like like that old War Games 1983 movie, you know, the, the best way to win is not to play. And so with right. nuclear weapons, everybody kind of keeps them in a reserve, but but then I, you know, no, no one has, has thankfully, no one has used them. So, as as I understand things, North Korea had initially approached the Soviet Union for help developing these things back in like 1963. Now, so the Soviet Union initially refused them. They later approached China for the same thing, and China refused them. Do, are, do you have any thoughts on on why both of those nations turned them down, especially since both of them have been ostensibly kind of in the same on the same side to some degree with North Korea? Right, and it's a matter of control, right? You you do for you know uh, USSR's case and for you know the PRC's case, both of them view Korea as, you know, a tool to be used, you know, a friendly puppet, you know, state, a vassal state. So giving them the power to threaten their master would not be a wise idea from mm -hmm. their point of view. So that's also the reason why, you know, China to this day is still for, uh, you know, North Korea's denuclearization, at least formally on paper, for the same reason, right? They really, they genuinely don't want Kim to have the capability to threaten them, to blackmail them if it ever came down to it. Because, you know, um, they're, they're also big believers of that old British quote, like, you know, there's no such thing as, you know, permanent friends, but only permanent interests, right? So for, for, that, uh, for them, empowering North Korea is great. Giving them that much power is not great. So they'll continue I, I, to do that. I, I see what you mean. Yeah, I mm -hmm. see what you mean. Yeah, that, that and that makes a lot of sense. Now, China is is considered to be North Korea's closest ally, and these nations actually have a mutual aid and cooperation treaty, which I understand is currently the only defense treaty that either country has with any nation. So, do you think that the increasing tensions with China that affect Western relations, um, do you think that they're affecting North Korea as a result? Not really affecting North Korea. Um, Kim likes to use those tensions to, you know, play one side off against each other, right? So um, with the last administration, when you know President Jong met with uh, Kim Jong Un, or President Trump met with Kim Jong Un, you know, um, Kim tried to, you know, go to China and say, "Hey, look, you know, uh, I might be making a little bit more uh, friendly with Americans." You know, you know, just FYI, in case, you know, you, you guys want to pressure us too hard, you know, things could change, right? And then when that fell through, then um, he went back and, you know, he said to China, hey, look, you know, I rejected the Americans, you know, out of solidarity uh, with China, right? So, you know, a little bit of playing both sides off against each other. And in terms of like the Taiwan Strait tensions, it's the same thing. It's a cheap way for Kim to say to China, hey, look, I'm, I'm still your friend, no matter what happens, you know, I'm, I'm here to support you. In terms of actual material support, it's nil, right? It's absolutely nil. Yeah, yeah, it, it is It is interesting to hear kind of what the, the back and forth is, with a lot of the dialogues there. So North Korea condemned uh, Speaker Pelosi's recent visit to Taiwan, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, Iran, Syria, Russia, and the Palestinian Authority also condemned it. 
Um, the Washington Post wrote that China is using the Taiwan Strait tensions as a tool to strengthen their relationship with North Korea. So it does it does sound like the, a lot of this is just playing off those strategic tensions. Would, would you agree with that or? Yeah, I mean, it really is. But it's much more on the part of um, Kim's case rather than on the part of China's case, just because there's limited utility that China sees in the Kim regime, right? And for the most part, Kim is already hitting all those targets that China would like them to hit. You know, right now, he's a big annoyance to the U.S. He's a big annoyance to South Korea. He makes sure that, you know, there's no American troops on, like, the Chinese border. And for the most part, that's pretty much what she wants to see from Kim. So in terms of strengthening that relationship, that's more of Kim's incentive and not Xi Jinping's incentive. I, I see. I see. Well, so, you know, there's there's another aspect to these concerns about nuclear weapons as well. And that is about nuclear proliferation, pro, proliferation to other nations. You know, and so when I was doing research for this, I found that North Korea actually got some of their nuclear capabilities from Pakistan's development program, right? And, and then I, I guess there's probably it would make sense that there would be an equal concern that other nations that want to become nuclear superpowers might approach North Korea the same way they've approached others, right? Is is there anything that can be done to help ensure that they don't arm rogue nations either intentionally or just by accident? Right. So the uh, a lot of the sanctions and a lot of the sanctions enforcement over the last 10 years or so have really been able to cut down on North Korean capability to do just that. And there's also the main factor that a lot of the wannabe nuclear weapon states have already gotten nukes, right? So there's uh, less incentive and less um, money available out there for uh, North Korea to do that proliferation game, which everybody recognizes is going to kick um, you know, tensions with the U.S. up uh, significantly. So, uh, yeah, between the um, enforcement regime, which has been actually quite strict and uh, and was actually greatly helped by uh, COVID hitting North Korea, that really, really did a number on the North Korean uh, economy and its, uh, you know, industries, including its war industries. Um, between all of these factors, that's less of a threat than where it was, say, about 10 or 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. No, COVID was undoubtedly a big, I, I mean, it was a massive disruptor for everyone. Right. And again, when I was doing research on that, it was, there was, there was this kind of chain of stories on this issue and then COVID hit and everything got kind of jumbled up. But yeah. um, one of the things that was interesting, and I think that this goes to the, the strategic um, you know, again, the bluff or the deterrence nature of this is that less than a year after North Korea tested the ICBM in September 2017, uh, North and South Korea signed the Panmunjom Declaration, which commits both countries to denuclearization and brings a formal end to the conflict, right? This conflict that's been going on since the 1950s. So did the did the DPRK use this bargaining cheat chip for a better seat at the negotiating table do you think or 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 was it instead the west that pushed these meetings because they said okay there's now potentially an imminent threat from these ICBMs a little bit of both right um so kim really wanted a little bit more uh, stature on the world stage and what better way to get it than you know the type of photo ops that he got with you know, U.S. president and with the Korean president. I mean, for him, this was, you know, pretty much PR heaven in terms of being able to say to his own people, hey, look at me, I am a great power now. They're dealing with me as an equal. Before, they didn't give me the time of day, and now they're sitting down at a table with me discussing my demands. And the North Korean populace certainly can't tell any different, right, just given the nature of the media environment over there. And then for the South Korean president, then um, he wanted, you know, the whole, you know, resolving the North Korean question to be his legacy, right? And he was willing to bend over backwards and make concessions uh, to make that happen, right? And that actually, you know, dovetailed what very well in with, um, you know, President Trump, because he, he too was looking at like that great big 
you know, legacy builder and certainly a uh, piece in the Korean Peninsula would have counted, right? So a lot, all these factors, you know, all, you know, matched up for, you know, this agreement. But of course, you know, as administrations in South Korea and the U.S. changed, and as Kim found out that neither, uh, you know, Korea and uh, primarily the U.S. wasn't willing to back off on some uh, you know, our key demands. And he decided, you know, okay, I've got enough of what I wanted out of this. I don't really want to pay the price. So I'm going to withdraw and just do what I've done pretty successfully over the last 10 years or so. Right. So he, he withdrew from that. And that really ultimately gets to that, uh, the big factor um, that really uh, plagues, um, you know, the, the chances of, of any North Korean denuclearization. And that's while economic growth on part of North Korea, it's nice for Kim Jong-un to have. It's not necessary for him. And in fact, it opens a number of risks uh, for him. You know, other people with money, which means other people with power that might, you know, challenge his rule uh, versus having nukes, which pretty much guarantees his rule. So for him, it's a very easy decision and it's not something that he's going to back away from. I, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Now, do you think that that uh, they may take a lesson, that North Korea may take a lesson from what they call Chinese-style communism? And and that, for me, that's been really interesting, right? Because China, they, they remain authoritarian, but they also have this really heavy, I'm not sure what you might call it, a free market approach, I guess. Very very trade oriented, very economically oriented, very outgoing oriented. And somehow China has been able to do this balancing act, right, between this this unified authoritarian party rule and this definitely these free market ambitions. Um, do you think that North Korea may be able to take a lesson from that? Do you think they're paying attention to that or is that not on their radar? So uh, North Korea has tried, you know, several, you know, steps to try to learn from, you know, what they would deem the Chinese model, right? And it's something that China is really proud of, rightly so. And they, they've tried to export that, if you will, to uh, North Korea as well. They've sent over, you know, um, you know, ec economists and also party officials to say, hey, look, you can economically liberal liberalize without the, you know, the nasty political dem democratic freedoms thing, right? But from the North Korean point of view, uh, their position is different from uh, China's back then, right? China reformed back in the late 80s because they were threatened by uh, Tiananmen and uh, they had a leader, uh, Deng Xiaoping, who was, you know, who realized, you know, the Communist Party was sort of on a knife's edge there, right? He had seen what happened uh, with the USSR. He was very concerned. He wanted to find a new way um, for North Korea. It's much more family based. It's much more personality based. Ironically, it's sort of where China is going today, but that's another that's another issue. But for because it is personality based and family based, there's a lot less of the institutional demand to reform. Right? There is no other power player within uh, the North Korean Communist Party that says, "Hey, look, we got to do this, or else the whole system falls apart." Right? It's just the interests of one family, the Kim family. So a lot less internal pressure on uh, North Korea to do what China did. Ah, I see. Well, Eric, let me thank you so much for your time today. And again, let me thank you to, for your service to our country. And let me close by asking, what do you anticipate seeing from North Korea next? Or is there any way to kind of guess or predict where we may see them in future headlines? I think it's going to be very similar to, you know, the previous headlines, right? They're going to be incrementally and in, uh, increasing their nuclear capability and their ballistic missile capability. And, you know, one day when they feel like they need to blackmail something out of South Korea or the U.S., they're going to do another flurry of, you know, nuclear tests and missile tests just to uh, show the world that they're still uh, relevant. That's something that hasn't changed for like the last 20 or 30, 30 years now. And in fact, I would say that, you know, because they know that they need to uh, show that they can control this nuclear power, 
that's actually a, le a less risky option for the entire world than what they used to do, like with, you know, axe murders and firing artillery and, you know, killing people, right? That, that's a lot less controllable. So being able to beat their chest and show, hey, look, we have nukes, hey, we have missiles. Okay, so be it. But again, a problem to be managed versus a problem that needs to be solved right away. Awesome. Eric, thank you again so much for your time. Thank you.